Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank, thank you for being here today. We will have movies, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I hope, I hope. <laughs> okay, uh, so as you noticed from the notes, for those of you who checked the notes, uh, I, I just exchanged the material, and in the presentation I've been consistent, though, with the with the program outline at the beginning. So I left uh, the question of uh, linking uh, and other concepts uh, related to helicity at the very end. I want to uh, go on with this uh, M of H. Remember yesterday we had uh, 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 emphasis on M of H. M of H is basically, uh, given the fact that uh, flux and volume are conserved, is basically the information we need in order to find the minimum energy states. And we expect, we expect that H being a measure of the twist, internal twist of the field lines, we expect that uh, probably M of H has to be, uh, um, for the minimum, uh, is probably a function with a minimum in H. And so we are looking for H equals zero if we want to have uh, really the minimum of that. Now, there, there are particular results. One uh, has been, uh, uh, um, has received contribution from many people. I have to quote uh, a number of them that worked. Uh, the first uh, is uh, rooted in the result of Arnold. So there are a number of people that during different years worked on this. 1974 started. And then uh, there is an important contribution by Friedman, Michael Friedman, uh, he was a Fields medalist and is still uh, working on topological aspects, but on, uh, on uh, quantum entanglement. is actually was responsible for the theory division of Microsoft up to some years ago. Uh, Friedman and Hay, uh, this is a result of uh, 91. Then I mentioned the result of Moffat, um, 1990, and I also contributed, and this is the, uh, the result I'm going to show you very briefly. This is 2008, and uh, the result is the following. Uh, let, so this is a, a compendium of uh, all these contributions. Uh, let B, uh, say, the field... Uh, uh, in a tubular knot, so this is a, a magnetic knot, uh, be a zero framed uh, link in general, or not, it doesn't matter, we can say link. Uh, a link is just a collection of knots uh, under uh, volume, or oh, let's say signature. Signature preserving, um, signature preserving flow. Uh, we have the following. In general, first is that magnetic energy M of T is uh, greater or equal. To two divided by so is a constant uh, two divided by pi, uh, and the volume this is a constant the volume is conserved to one uh, one third times the helicity magnetic helicity of the field of the system. Uh, yesterday we saw that uh, under relaxation magnetic energy was bounded from below by a quantity q related to this uh, Poincaré inequality, um, times uh, helicity. And Q was a measure of uh, uh, size. We wrote Q of the order of 1 over L. And indeed, uh, here we have uh, uh, the cubic uh, root of V at the denominator, which is indeed a measure of the length of the system. So indeed this Q can be identified by this, by this quantity. And the second information was uh, M min, 
m min, we had uh, this m function uh, left, uh, left uh, dimensionless uh, uh, function left uh, uh, undetermined, and we can now say that this is pi v third times uh, phi squared times c min. So the m, the little m, uh, if we set h equals zero, is function is a topological crossing number. So it seems that this uh, result is uh, kind of closing the door to this discussion, but, but, the story starts from here. Why? Because, uh, no, I didn't write it down. Maybe I have it somewhere. Uh, C min, if C min is a three, we cannot go under three, then we have only one not type. But if C min grows for four, one not type. But uh, uh, for five, for five, uh, we have uh, uh, already two knot types. And uh, for seven, many more knot types. Many more. And these C min grows uh, the knot types. So the number, the number of knot types topologically different, different. Uh, let's say that goes, that goes with a constant a to c min. Increases with c min, you see, very rapidly. So the question of having, suppose uh, we take a uh, five crossing knot, a knot, here there are two knot types, and here it says that the minimum energy is due to c min, and is this. So, what does it mean? If we have uh, two knot types, we put a five here, and m min, are we sure that m min is the same for the two knot types? You know, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, an information on the volume that doesn't help. So, even if we fix volume for the same knot types, uh, we are not quite sure. And the reason is that this information is correct, but is valid, uh, how to say, on average. Suppose uh, you take C min equal 10. You have so many knot types. How can you have a function so precise that uh, tells you for every single knot type uh, maybe tiny differences in energy? So that's why in the notes you have uh, this uh, rather elaborated uh, 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 calculation of the Lorentz force for the, uh, for the meridional and the axial field inside the tube because we need to have some information about the twist and then set the twist eventually to, to zero and maybe understand, examine all possible knot types through some method to see if, what, what, if we can recover this and if the information that we get not only allows us to recover this on average, but that tells us it, something about each single knot type. So now this is a work that is mentioned there, uh, but is too long to reproduce, and is based on uh, uh, constrained, constrained relaxation of uh, knot types of magnetic knots. And the constraints are the assumptions I'm going to write. So this is the result of work that uh, I've done with uh, Maggioni, Francesca Maggioni, and myself. And this is uh, 2009, I think. And is also uh, based on work, on earlier work done by Chewy and uh, Moffat. Uh, this one I don't remember though, I'm sorry. Um, some time passed and I didn't, uh, I probably is in the notes. Has to be, I have no idea. I think 
is maybe 1992, something like this. Sorry. Um, probably I've written that surely in, uh, in my papers, but uh, I don't have uh, the exact, the exact uh, reference uh, um, at hand. Anyway, so they elaborated the, um, uh, the application of, uh, through the application of, uh, of uh, calculus of variation, uh, a relaxation under the assumption that uh, twist H may change. Um, we did uh, this work with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a choice of Mercier coordinates that ensure that they are orthonormal. Uh, and so uh, we found basically the same results because it gets uh, rather sophisticated, so no much, no much difference between the, the two approaches, but it's important to state the assumption, the constraints. So the result is the following. Let BK denote this magnetic knot or knots uh, under given by the decomposition B, uh, BM plus BA that I, I, I mentioned last time, uh, minimization, minimization, minimization of magnetic energy of M of T is uh, subject to the following assumption Let's call them constraints, constraints, because, uh, uh, you know, to do some analytical work, you need, you need uh, some simplicity. And uh, in numerics, you can implement uh, things to improve this result, I'm sure. So first of all, this is invariant, and we know that. The second assumption is uh, that uh, flux uh, flux tube cross section, cross section remains circular. Circular at all times. And in particular at the time of the, when the relaxation comes to an end, uh, this is a rather uh, strong assumption because it's a fluid. And so it will relax and relax and relax so that uh, its, uh, its cross-section will deform and adapt the tightening process. So not at all good assumption, but in order to make some progress, this is the chance we have. Then there is a perturbation this is long to explain, but there is a flux perturbation. There is an average flux plus some uh, a sinusoidal perturbation. So this, uh, this is independent, is uniform, let's say. If, you, if we understand what we mean, is, uh, this, this fluctuation is uniform along, uh, along the flux tube, along uh, uh, the flux tube. And then the last one, uh, the knot length, each knot length is assumed to be independent. Independent uh, from uh, H. Uh, you know, when you, when you put twist, in a rope, when you put twist in a rope, of course, uh, it eats up some length, hmm? some length. So you assume that H uh, and the total length uh, are not talking to each other. Then, uh, under this assumption, we have uh, uh, that uh, M star, which is uh, the minimum is the minimum under these constraints. So I put a star to remember, to tell us, okay, maybe it can be relaxed even more. 
But anyway, this is uh, um, the formula. I will write the formula in a moment. I will explain in a moment uh, this uh, formula. But let me write it first. Lambda for third over two pi uh, to the two third plus pi for third h that h squared over lambda to the two third uh, times uh, phi squared volume minus a third where where lambda is rope length. I'll tell you what is rope length. Well, rope length, uh, uh, there are, uh, uh, there are uh, precise, more precise ways to define it. But imagine that we go to the minimum, the relaxed state, then rope length is a non-dimensional quantity that uh, refers to the ratio the ratio i got very often confused which way which way this ratio is defined don't tell me that i didn't i missed it maybe i did no i didn't l over r because sometimes i think of r over l in uh, in many contexts r over l uh, you know, is the aspect ratio, so that's why I got confused sometimes. L star is the minimum length under relaxation of the knot, and R is the maximum, remember, the flux is conserved, is the maximum radial uh, dimension of the tube. So when the tube gets fatter and fatter, remember the torus. You know, we start uh, with a simple unknotted uh, torus, and we relax it to what we may say is a, a torus without a hole. Hmm? Something like this. You understand what I mean. Now, suppose that this cross-section is circular. Then uh, this is R. And uh, in particular, R star, if we keep it circular. Then uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't draw circles just to... Uh, tell you that, of course, nobody, nobody prescribe nature does not prescribe to stay circular. So it can squeeze and squeeze and squeeze, right? But suppose we stay circular, and if we stay circular, then the radius of the tight configuration, tight, tight, uh, tight knot, and this is loose knot. In particular, this is the unknot. Okay, right. I'm playing with words a little bit. So this is the loose knot, and this is the tight knot. And the tight knot will have a L, a total length in the tight configuration, which is minimal. And we take the minimal length divided by the maximal radius, uh, and uh, we define rope length. So rope length is a number. And actually is a very powerful number. And you understand that it's useful. You understand because, you know, you may take uh, ropes and you tighten the knot. And then the rope, uh, if it is a physical thick rope, uh, then hardly, hardly uh, changes its, uh, its uh, cross-section. But with this uh, measure... Uh, uh, you have some ways to analyze uh, or to measure uh, properties, mechanical properties of this, of this knotted rope. Why I'm saying this? Because uh, if you ask a sailor or if you ask a mountaineer, they know very well which knot to use in order to have a certain amount of, uh, uh, you know, in relation to the function of the knot. For example, in mountains, you climb and you knot uh, the rope in order to save your life, to ensure yourself. But then you have to knot the rope 
in a way to be able to unknot it quickly. So you knot a particular type of knot that is easy to be unknotted. So you don't do trifle knots. Because when they are tight, especially if you fall, you know, they get extremely tight and you cannot unknot them uh, quickly. So the properties of knots are very important for lots of reasons. And in nature, these properties are reflected. Because not all knots are used according to, uh, you know, according to the function they have. If, if they just have to hold it, okay. But if you think to undo it, then you have to... And so this is related, of course, to the material surfaces of the knot uh, that touch themselves. And the friction that there is, because these are real ropes, real, real knots, etc., etc. So there is a very, very interesting field of study. Anyway, so this is the parameter. A, a, a brief comment, and then I want just to show you two curves and we are done uh, uh, about this part, is that uh, indeed uh, the uh, twist is here. If it increases, twist uh, increases the minimum energy. And so if we are looking for m, a little m over there, m at h equals zero, at h equals zero, which is uh, the state of these uh, results in a sense, then we have to neglect this uh, functional dependence. Okay? But, of course, you can trace, uh, you can draw your diagrams and see how this changes, it, and this was done. Now, uh, let's assume for simplicity that uh, H is zero. So the internal linking is zero. So we are left with this function. We are left with this function. And now what we do? Now we do the following. You know, is a function of lambda only. And lambda is, oh, sorry, I forgot to say it, is rope length. Rope length. Now, uh, in order to find this for knots, for all possible knots, well, this is a big work. So we resort, there's a group of people who have done a wonderful, wonderful work for a number of years. So first of all, let me say something about this uh, knot uh, tabulation. So nowadays, uh, uh, nowadays, uh, there are uh, websites where you can go and uh, check uh, various invariant quantities, topological invariants, and the geometric information sometimes uh, on knots. And so one website uh, 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 is uh, one of the many. One important website is Knot Atlas, for instance. Um, uh, this is the work of uh, a number of people, I think, originated from Barnatan Initiative and then uh, developed. Uh, so you, you, you check on this atlas of knots and you have many, many properties. And then people started to say, okay, what about relaxing the knot? So relaxing the knot, you, you do it numerically. You take every single knot, and these tabulated, maybe they are, I don't know exactly, but suppose there are hundreds hundreds, maybe thousands of knots, of different knot types. So you take information from the atlas of knots, and then you construct a code, a numerical code, that relaxes the knot under the assumption of volume and flux preserving. Now, we can drop the flux, but the volume, so if it shrinks, it increases in the cross-section. Flux is a, a field through the cross-section. Hmm? So the flux is, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, can be worked out for physical application. But in, in the numerical code, we want just to establish this pure number. This is a pure number. And so in order to establish this pure, pure number, we want to have a code that relaxes this knot to the tight configuration. So you're given a, a knot, say so the trifle knot, you get it fatter, fatter as, uh, as I showed you yesterday, and then you get your information about lambda. You, can, you compute L, you compute R, and you have your lambda. So there is a table. So this work was done by the group, uh, uh, a number of people. I would like to quote uh, Cantorella in particular, uh, and uh, uh, Eric uh, Rodon. Uh, I would like to also quote uh, uh, another person who contributed so much to this is Rob Sharine. Uh, 
the inventor of a wonderful program, not plot. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll show you uh, just a snapshot of uh, not plot. Not plot uh, has uh, not in it, and uh, uh, till some years ago was free. Now it cost uh, well, it's really little money even for China. Is it costs something like thirty dollars, uh, something like that. Um, uh, the um, not plot was developed a long time ago now, and uh, so it takes a not data, and, uh, and with this data you can work out lots of aspects. Also geometry of knots, because these knots can be deformed. Given a knot, you deform it without cuts. Or you can construct new knots from scratch. Or you can construct uh, something that you think is a new knot, and then you let it relax, and uh, during relaxation, through a number of forces, one being the elasticity, the other one may be the magnetic, and the other one, uh, you find out if the knot that you invented is known or not. It's a way to explore new knot types and other properties. Uh, Cantrell and Rodon developed a, a program that is called the Ridge Runner. Uh, Ridge Runner. And we relied, uh, uh, so Ridge Runner, I, um, I think, I'm sure, that all the data from Ridge Runner are uh, freely available. Lots of, lots of data. So you checked on uh, hundreds of knots. And now the result I like uh, to tell you is this. So we took Rog, uh, um, uh, Ridge uh, Runner data and uh, we put them here. And we just plot the energy, that's all. And we found something quite, quite remarkable. Um, so remember, we are talking about tight knots, so we are at the ground state of that energy. Ground state of that energy. And so uh, we have uh, found uh, something like this. Uh, you have it in your notes. Uh, uh, so under Ridge Runner, relaxation, you have a best fit here. We have a sort of non-dimensional energy. We non-dimensionalize this, this number. From m, we go to m, little m, and from little m, we divide it by the titan knot. So this uh, is a function, is function of uh, the knot tabulation. But which knot tabulation? That was the, the new thing. So we tried to, uh, to put here the knot as they are tabulated till recently. And we didn't find any particular, you know, emerging uh, uh, behavior. But then we had the idea to have uh, a look at uh, Ridge Runner data and to tabulate these knots according to increasing value of lambda, of rope length. And if you, uh, if you put here uh, your, your knot types, uh, organized with respect to rope length, then the story is different. Is different. I, I want to tell you, not tabulation. You go to these tables of knots. I told you, for five crossing, you have two knots, five one and five two. For six crossing, three knots. Sorry, I forgot to say. say I jumped to seven. Six crossing, you have three, three types of knots, and so on. Why? Why the first knot in the five crossing class is first? And why the second knot is second? And for years, <laughs> I thought, uh, you know, you don't think about this. There may be some reason. And then when you want to use and you want to uh, put uh, order here, you have a 5-1 and 5-2. You put first the 5-1 and second the 5-2. But then you realize that there, there is no reason to have what we call 5-1 before the 5-2. You know what is the reason? Historical. The 5-1 was uh, formed before, and the 5-2 after. That's why. So when you go to 7 crossing, 8 crossing, 9 crossing, you have so many uh, knot types. There is no reason why a, a given knot has to be there or after uh, the other one. But if you order this knot according to rope length, then it's a different story. And the diagram you get is something like this. And this curve uh, obeys uh, this uh, 
these low. So these are ordered according to rope length, according to lambda value. Uh, so the, the function uh, is an empirical one, is uh, 4.5 logarithm of uh, this uh, number, the position of the knot plus 10.5, and this result is uh, for knots. How many? We have 250 knots. 250 knots have been, have been, uh, have been uh, computed uh, using, using Ridge Runner. And when we go to links, when we go to links, I would put an L here, we have this 4.5 logarithm of uh, the position of the link according to rope length plus 9.3. Two things. First, the shape of this curve. is not amazing? The one family, 300, 250 knots fall more or less on this curve and the links basically on the same curve. I mean the shape. I don't want to talk about this. I want to talk, not numbers. Don't focus on numbers. Focus on the shape. Shape is interesting. Shape is interesting. So I don't want to say anything. I just ask students and young people to tell me, do you know this? This is a function. You have to, to think 200 is nothing. So you think of uh, thousands of possibilities. And so it has to be interpreted in a, in a sense of statistical mechanics. Hmm? This is like uh, related to Boltzmann statistics, I don't know, something like that. Hmm? Right. And the second thing is the remarkable, I mean, we didn't uh, force anything, it's just the remarkable uh, uh, similarities between these two laws. I mean, this is basically. You know, is the best fit this curve, of course, because you don't think I mean this is numeric, right? So it's a best fit law, and I reported the accuracy of this best fit, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, just to let you understand how well is uh, fitted by these functions. And this number is exactly the same, and this is a very uh, small discrepancy. Uh, you you may think of uh, alter a little bit according to some ground state energy, you know. All right, so this is the part, uh, and then there is further discussion because there is an attempt to justify this, uh, this behavior, but uh, I don't want to duel on that. You can read it for yourself. I want to move to helicity now because uh, so far we discussed about the relevance of uh, crossing numbers. Each, uh, each knot has a crossing number, but here there are knots uh, with the same crossing number. There are different knot types with different energies. And if you do an average on the each family you recover, you recover the expression I told you before, function of C min independent of the knot type. So you recover that. All right. Now, uh, I'd like to mention, since I mentioned the group of uh, Cantarella, um, I'd like to mention that there's been... Uh, uh, work on, I mean, the last uh, 10 years, less than that, works uh, uh, Cantarella, Rodon, and the people in high energy physics to establish a correspondence between uh, fundamental state of matter in terms of energy and this uh, information on tight knots, etc. In particular, I'd like to mention work by uh, Tom Kepperth. Uh, so if you want to uh, pay attention, Tom Kepperth. And, uh, um, and uh, Roman Bugni. I'm, I'm in trouble to remember how to write this. I think it's like this. So they, together with Cantrell and Rodo, have a paper on, uh, and probably more than one paper, on a, a big paper, I remember, on uh, establishing a relationship between the tight knot in the ideal relaxed uh, case and the measurements from... CERN from uh, high energy physics. All right. 
Uh, helicity now. Let's go back to helicity and uh, its topological interpretation because uh, uh, we mentioned that uh, the minimum energy is bounded from below by helicity and also uh, the energy is a function of topology, especially when we go to, uh, I mean, the, en the minimum energy uh, certainly function of uh, topology. So what about uh, uh, helicity as a measure of topology? So this is uh, uh, basically rooted in work of Moffat uh, 69. I have, uh, um, I have uh, I've thought to propose you first a measure of uh, topology so we understand what we talk about because we know what is a helicity but uh, topology has many, many um, uh, invariant quantities uh, and one uh, is very important, is due to Gauss uh, 1833, and then uh, he disappeared, the result, because it was uh, uh, some, uh, a result he wrote for himself on, uh, on a personal notebook. And then these uh, pages went lost, and they were found in, in 1867, and in 1867, uh, uh, still uh, this result was... No, was, didn't circulate much because it was collected with the new material fund of Gauss and was put uh, in a collection of, uh, of course, many other results. And they didn't know where to put this result because this result has to do with topology, but topology emerged at the time of Gauss. So a few, a few years later, there was no topology. Hmm? No topology. I told you, topology is the word invented by listing uh, to to a student, probably the only real student of Gauss. People say Riemann was a student of Gauss. This is not true. Uh, Gauss was a, was a, a president, a chairman of the committee who appointed uh, Riemann. But uh, so, but Listing was was a student of Gauss, and uh, uh, you know he invented <laughs> Listing invented what we attribute now to Möbius. He invented the Möbius band. The Möbius band is due to listing. Uh, but listing in topology didn't do very much. This is a little booklet. We examined the booklet with Claude Weber, who is an expert on, on these things. And uh, he told me we, we agreed that there was not much in that. Anyway, he introduced the word topology, topology. Uh, the, the Latin word was uh, geometry of position. So I told you, in Maxwell, if you look for topology, you don't find any. So Renzo, what, what Renzo said to look at Maxwell, Maxwell preface, look for geometry of position. Ah, geometry of position, the whole chapter. Okay, so uh, Gauss uh, remarked, uh, and the mystery remained uh, on how he proved it, because there is no proof that this quantity, let me call it a linking number, let's say linking number, Linking number between two curves, closed curves, etc., etc. Two simple closed curves in R three, C one, and uh, C two is given by this formula, LK12, 1 over 4 pi, uh, double integral on C1 and C2. These are, of course, closed integrals. X1 minus X2 divided by, uh, sorry, DX is a triple product. DX1 um, cross DX2 divided by X1 minus X2 mod cube. A topological invariant of the link. Between C1 and C2. And the story behind this 
is interesting, very interesting. I wrote a paper on this uh, uh, with uh, Nipoti, and uh, if you like to have a look, uh, I think is um, Nipoti in uh, 2011, stimulated by um, by so many attempts. Uh, uh, that people made uh, to justify this formula because, and we reconstructed this formula uh, the, from the work of Gauss, reading work of Gauss, because many people report how he derived possibly this formula and it is absolutely impossible. He did it on the basis of what people claim. But if you go to Gauss' work and you study, for example, his work on... Uh, on geomagnetism, geomagnetism, then you understand how it gets to this formula. Now I'll try to, to justify it quickly for you, quickly, because the formula that you see here is exactly the formula that is uh, written on his private uh, note. So if you look at this formula this way, uh, you are puzzled, right? Because you think, how on earth, how on earth, he says that this double integral of uh, a curve and another one of, uh, say, this one and this one uh, linking one with the other, say, C1 with the C2, uh, is a quantity LK that is a topological invariant of the link. You wonder how on earth he could, he could say something like this. And I've read incredible attempts. The most stupid ones are the ones that uh, say, okay, I prescribe the geometry of C1 and C2, say two circles, and I compute this thing. Can you, can you imagine? I compute these things analytically, and then I, in some way I justify that what I get, a number, is invariant under deformation. Or even worse than this, I give uh, some prescri parametric prescription of this. <laughs> Impossible. I mean, uh, through geometry, you want to prove something about topology? I mean, is possible. We know that some, there are a couple of instances where it's possible. But it's, it's extremely, I mean. One other possibility is to now to interpret maybe what he did. So my interpretation to you in a minute, is a bit rough, but please follow me. First of all, there is a 4 pi here, and is there. So first thing is to remove this 4 pi here and put it inside, 4 pi. It's good to have it there. And then you have x1 minus x2, x1 denoting a point on c1, x2 denoting a point on c2, right? And so you do... There is an x1 minus x2. Let me call x1 minus x2. Uh, let me call it r. Okay? is a vector. And this vector, uh, so we do the following now. We have a vector here, r. And the vector here, like this. And then uh, we notice that r divided by mod r is a unit vector, right? So I simplify one r here, I put a, a hat, and I have this, right? Okay? Nothing changed. And then we do another little exercise, and we think that this r, this one, is a unit quantity. So this quantity is a unit quantity. And if it is a unit quantity, uh, this is just 4 pi. It's just 4 pi. And now we do one more thing. We didn't, we didn't do any calculation, right? We just observe things and learn from, from elaboration. Now we notice this is a triple product, triple product, of the quantity here is a unit, no dimensions, and the dimensions here is just the surface. Dx is a length on a curve and another length of another curve. So this is a surface. 
This is a surface with its own uh, uh, normal direction. And this is a particular surface. Do you remember? Yeah. OK, it's a sphere. And now I cannot pretend to convince you because you have to read. It's a, it's a history. Uh, it's a piece of, uh, uh, you know, uh, work. But uh, let me just tell you that first, Gauss was a royal astronomer, royal astronomer. His business, his main business was about astronomy. Secondly, that uh, he often, so often, thought of himself, of himself in the sense of us, as the center of the observation. And observing the sky, he was at the center of a sphere. And indeed, when you map whatever is in the universe, you map it on a Gauss sphere. And that is the Gauss horizon. That is the Gauss horizon. So now, you think to be at the center of a sphere, and you look at, this, at these uh, curves, and you interpret these curves. Gauss, I claim, that uh, he came to this through potential theory. And you can, you can read all his contributions. He, he got this formula from geomagnetism, from potential theory. But... There is another possible interpretation, and this is the interpretation that these uh, curves are trajectories in, mechanical, in celestial mechanics. And you wonder, you wonder, don't think of a linkage, think of orbits. And you wonder, one orbit is like this and the other is like this, totally unlinked. And then maybe they are parallel, maybe they intersect, maybe they intersect one orbit against the other. And then if you just do a further move, you have one orbit that is inside the other. So if you are at the center of the sphere, you can see the crossing, the crossing, the apparent crossing, or the real crossing, if there is a collision, satellites, etc. Uh, you see an apparent crossing of these orbits. So this ratio gives you the possibility of counting the apparent crossings of the strands, of these strands. So you go from this part to the solid angle definition. Elementary, this is an elementary solid angle, and the integral of that, the integral of this, is because it's topology, it does not depend on the geometry. You can reduce all this to something like this, sorry, this is solid elementary, solid angle, uh, and uh, counting the apparent crossings, you can reduce this formula to an algebraic expression. You count the crossings. You count the crossings. So I say, well, there is an one half for some reason, summation over the crossings. Now I need uh, a quick way to let you calculate that. A quick way to calculate that. So algebraic, algebraic interpretation. of a linking. OK, this is simple. We have to introduce a notation, first of all. Notation is, uh, for example, this one. This is, uh, you assign the sign minus to this, say minus 1. And uh, I usually put my thumb, everyone has his own rule. But suppose we stick to the same rule is to put a thumb on whatever is above. And whatever is behind, hmm, under crossing, if it is against your fingers, is a minus. And if it is uh, in favor of your fingers, you put a, a thumb on the top one and you have a plus. Okay? So all the time you have a plus and the minus you have a crossings. All the times you have a crossing, you have a plus or a minus. Okay? 
you call this quantity plus minus one is the sign is the sign of the crossing, and then uh, what you do you take uh, you take your link you take your link and you project it on a diagram. And now I know what you're thinking because you're thinking, oh, well, it depends on the projection. I can project it this way or the other way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, it's true. It depends on the projection, but but that number, this one, i.e., this one, i.e., this, is a topological quantity. It does not depend on the projection. Once you get the value, whatever is the deformation, whatever is your angle of your your line of sight, your direction of projection, whatever it is, it doesn't change. So let's uh, let's put an orientation of these curves. We like oriented curves. Why? Because we think of fields. Fields have an orientation. So we like to think of these curves as oriented curves. Which orientation? Whatever we like. We like this one? Okay, we put this one. Okay, we can change orientation. Doesn't matter. It will affect the, calc the, the computation. Mm, I don't know. We'll see. Okay, so, and then we have to use this rule. So I have, uh, uh, just to start, good idea to put arrows near each, near each crossing consistently, consistently, and so here I have to go like this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I put my rule, and my rule says that this is a, a, a plus one, plus one, and uh, this is a plus one, right? So I go here, and I compute uh, for this system LK12. I have a plus one, and plus one is plus two, plus two, and uh, divided by two, a half plus two plus one. Okay, so I'm happy. I'm happy I can compute uh, the link, uh, linking number between these two curves, whatever is uh, their orientation, and I conclude that linking number between these two guys, one and two, is uh, zero. I'm very happy, right? Because it works. I can compute a uh, uh, linking number of whatever linkage I like, and I'm happy. So it's a topological quantity, does not depend on the projection. I jump uh, immediately to something uh, of these days. So it's very good for computations, fantastic. You take, uh, you take uh, any uh, network of curves, you take a projection, any projection, possibly the simplest, possibly the most convenient, whatever, any projection, at one instant, and if topology does not change, you apply this rule, whatever is the complication, you get the number that is a topological quantity. Can we use the origin formula to calculate this linking number? Yes, you can. Of course you can. That formula has lots of troubles for uh, certain guys that are quite experienced here in numerics, because you see, is it, of course you can, yes. But you have to, do, to, to, to integrate on each curve, on each curve, and then you have a, a trouble of this uh, uh, elementary contribution when the curves are very close, and then you, you have one over, one over the distance, x1 minus x2, so the farther problem is when these two curves are extremely close. So it gives you a lot of trouble. But of course, it's done. I'm tempted to say why it has been done so much, um, I, I shut up. I, I, you will see why has been done already many times without knowing that they were using linking number. But uh, I'll come in a minute to that. Uh, okay. So uh, Maxwell, yes. Before the next step, yeah. Uh, may I just uh, show you? Uh, I have uploaded the paper, your paper. Ah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's an interesting paper, not because I wrote the paper. No, 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 no. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's beautiful. I think uh, I'm very happy about that paper. Uh, absolutely. It's one of the things that do not uh, affect science at all, but it's one of the things that you are relieved. You, you see very well all this uh, development of various ideas. Anyway, and, um, and Maxwell, from that paper, 
I put a, a copy of uh, what I found because I wanted the Library of Cambridge at doing a lot of search one summer. Um, Maxwell noticed, first of all, he derived himself the same formula, but independently. And uh, when uh, it was uh, time for his book to come out, it was a bit late for the formula, for the formula, because the formula of Gauss was, re, was made known to people in uh, 1867, which is exactly the time that Maxwell um, was ready to publish the formula. And so Maxwell, as great he was, uh, he acknowledged Gauss. And he immediately addressed the attention of Tate. Remember, Tate was his uh, former tutor, good, good friends, schoolmates. Uh, he addressed the attention of Tate that in Cambridge Library, there is a, vol there is a copy of, uh, the, of the Gauss linking number formula made public. And so he said, uh, I had to, to search for it. Uh, he uses a different word, but I, I had to search for it a lot because, of course, it was a rare um, uh, publication to have. And uh, they could read German, huh? by the way. Hmm? At the time, people used to read, to, to speak uh, at, least, at least one other language. They were writing. He was writing. He was, he, they used to write, if I were writing to you, I would have written my letter in Chinese and you would have replied in Italian, you know. Amazing, different, uh, different times. Uh, to be gentle one another, you know, to be nice one another. And, uh, and so they could read the German. Anyway, uh, and he noticed instantly, instantly, that uh, this formula has a problem. There are some knots and, or some links that uh, do have a problem with this formula. And Tate was so happy, you remember the ups and downs of uh, not topologists. It was a time where already collected some material, uh, ready to publish it, but it was hit by this information by Maxwell. And this information is in the book, in his Electricity and Magnetism book. So you have to go second volume, and you have to search a little bit for that. Uh, it depends on the edition. I remember my, the edition I remember was about page 70 or something like that. And you look, you look for linking number formula, you look for solid angle. Solid angle, that's the entry, the best entry. And you immediately find a, a section dedicated to solid angle, and then you have the formula immediately afterwards, and is the way, is the way he derives the linking number formula. Um, amazing. It's a theory, a mathematical theory of electricity and magnetism, volume two of Maxwell. It's a standard book, but many miss that. And when I was young, I started to tell people, well, you know, uh, there is a particular type of, uh, of uh, 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 knot and link reference where he says that linking number fails. So he immediately noticed that. As soon as he derived the formula, he was happy and simultaneously noticing the limiting, uh, the limit, the limit of this formula. So there is an example, a famous example. I mean, I try to at attempt uh, uh, the whitehead link. You know how to draw it? Well, I try the the Burmian rings. So uh, let me try the Burmian. I have my own way to remember how to draw them. So please l l just give me some time, uh, and then you understand what I have in mind. Burmian rings are very simple. Three rings, and then you do one, you decide to start from any you like here, and you, you start to uh, draw this first circle above this one. So it goes above this here, and, uh, and under the rest. And then you do the same with the second one, uh, above this one. So above this one, it should do like this. Oh, above, sorry. Okay, and then uh, the third one is, uh, let's say, green, maybe, uh, above this one. So you would go like this and like this. Now you have the Burmian rings. The names come from a family in Milano, near Milano, uh, uh, name is Borromeo. Borromeo was an important uh, um, 
bishop, very influential in Italy. And the family was an influential family in the north of Italy. And they have an island with this symbol uh, in the coat of arm of the family. And this symbol has its own uh, little history. And there is a beautiful paper on that in the, I think, mathemati mathematical intelligence of many, many years ago by a lady. I don't remember the name. Anyway, the, these are the rings. And if we put some, uh, some uh, reference here, say this field, whatever. Well, it doesn't matter, really. This field and this field, like so. So the orientation is chosen. So we go to the first one you see is minus. With this one, we do the exterior one first, and this is a minus. And then we go here, and this is also a minus. So we have three minuses, and then we go inside. And inside, we have a plus here, and the plus here, and the plus here. So if we compute the linking number of uh, one, two, and three, one, two, and three, then we get zero. So what's the difference between this and this? Of course, this we cannot we cannot disentangle. This uh, this this is a link. Is a link of three components, three colors, hmm? and we cannot disentangle it. And so, there is some problem with this linking number. Linking number, yes, is a measure of topology, but is not enough to capture the topological complexity of certain systems that. Very briefly, is the reason why people started to work on other invariants. Because we have already some invariants, right? We have the number of components is an invariant. Three in this case, two in this case, one in this case. <laughs> then we have uh, the minimum number of crossings, zero, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six crossings. So the number of components, the number of crossings, and then we have a linking number, the linking number. Linking number in this case is zero. In that case, there are two components, two crossings, uh, linking number one. But in this case, we have three components, uh, six crossings, and linking number zero, which sets back the problem. So from there, people started to develop other invariants. So the course is a short introduction to, so I cannot go on on that, but uh, uh, knots uh, and knots and knots with polynomials. Polynomials are giving you just, uh, don't think of roots of a polynomial. Think of an expression uh, with powers, and uh, this expression is uh, invariant even if you change the knot and you deform it under continuous deformation. So this expression is a topological invariant quantity. And then a different knot. So this knot has a polynomial that cannot be reduced to the polynomial of this knot. So the polynomials are consistent with our search for, uh, for uh, topological quantities. And the idea is, suppose I get a, a polynomial that uh, I put all, all possible information in it. Maybe the polynomial is a little bit sophisticated, is uh, strong enough to tell me whatever is the knot, uh, this is a polynomial of that knot, not even that. Because uh, of uh, thousands of millions of knots, sometimes the polynomial fails to distinguish two different knot types. Two different knot times come up to have the same polynomial. And so this is the reason why people said, oh, really? Uh, I have to look for something else then. But polynomials are pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. And of course, encapsulate in some way the information of crossings and linking. Hmm? Right, I have to stop here. This is a, just a brief introduction. Uh, but I want to say something about helicity now. So I have to prove uh, something about helicity. And I'll do the following. So this is uh, the result we are going to, to, uh, to demonstrate. This is fundamental result in topological fluid mechanics, 1969. is a JFM paper and is not written the way I write uh, for some reason that I will explain uh, afterwards, in ideal conditions, uh, 
the helicity um, Hm will stick to magnetic field of uh, a magnetic uh, link, uh, let's say B, A, K, of uh, two or more components. Uh, in the shape, I will relax. I will uh, relax this uh, in a moment. But now I need uh, to say in a shape of planar ring, planar rings. So like uh, like this one. Imagine that this is uh, one ring and this is another ring, and they are linked together linked together, inseparably, but we, we assume that they are planar for some reason. Then we relax, we relax this condition of uh, center line, say, CI. And uh, tubular boundary, a magnetic surface. So no flux through it. Uh, of flux with and flux and the flux phi i. In ideal condition, the helicity is given by uh, Hm equal. Remember, we had the. Uh, we had the definition of helicity, A dot B, D, V, where this DV is, is uh, a localized domain. And now we simplify this into thinking that uh, this uh, domain is made by two, two tubes. Then this helicity is uh, given by A, I different from J, L, uh, phi, I, phi j, each flux, multiplied by l k i j. So I have here a flux phi 1 and a flux phi 2. OK, this is, of course, I imagine that this is a field by field lines. And of course, this is the same. Okay, and they are linked like that, or not, or not. But the helicity is uh, expressed in terms of their linkage. All right, so I have to prove this. Uh, so we we stick to these uh, two rings, and now what I'll do. Uh, I'll uh, maybe I'll I'll, I'll just uh, redo the the drawing here. So I I called uh, the white one was a uh, one. Okay, five one. So let let me do this. One is this, and the other is is this. Okay. So this, and this, this is phi one, and this is phi two, and then uh, we consider these two rings uh, of uh, small cross section. Okay, this will help in the in the mathematics. Um, so we identify the flux phi one with the field B uh, inside, and the flux phi 2 with the field inside the tube. So we have uh, the flux phi 1 equal the integral of uh, A dl 
of ADL, this flux is constant, so let me write it immediately as a constant, but the phi one, I can interpret the phi one as the circulation, as the circulation of A, remember the flux is B through a surface, right? But B, there is a relationship you know, B, we talked about this, uh, with, the, with the vector potential. So I will use this relation with the vector potential to uh, express phi through Stokes as a circulation of A uh, along uh, the axis uh, C2. Okay. So I call this quantity, which is a constant, because it's related to C2, I will call it K2. All right. Now, clearly we have a K1 from Stokes' theorem. We apply Stokes' theorem to C1. K1 will be also, this is C1 now, huh? so it will be also A dot L on C1. And uh, this is evidently what we did, uh, if, if S1 is the cross-section, is just a B nu across uh, the cross-section V2X. All right, S1 being the cross-section here. So we use now the fact that uh, K1 is uh, either zero or different from zero if uh, what? If this is plus minus phi 2, K1 is plus minus phi 2 if the two links, if uh, C1 is linked with C2 and is zero if uh, there is no link, if C1 is not uh, linked with C2. The plus, plus minus depends on the fact that uh, the flux is entering one direction or the other. Okay, now, uh, K1, we combine, we combine the results. K1 related to phi 2 and related to phi 1. K1, if K1 is uh, uh, the result of one passage of uh, phi 2, through, through it, then is either plus or minus one. But if we have, uh, if uh, of this phi two, we have many passages here, we have a number of them. We don't know which number, but you understand. It can be phi one, or two times phi one, or three times phi one. You know, it's like a solenoid. Like a solenoid, you know, it can go like this, and like this, and like this, and then close out. Okay, so if uh, this is uh, the number, we call it, uh, by chance, <laughs> LK12. But we don't know that it is a Gauss linking number. We don't know. It is a number. It is a number. Okay, LK12, phi 2. Right. So if we have, in general, uh, a number of... Uh, phi 1, a number of links C1, linked with a number of links C2. This can be generalized even farther. So we have a chi i equal. This is due to uh, the integral over single curves Ci of ADL. Of what? Of a summation. All contribution. So we have on j, L k i j going on phi j for 
a number of, uh, uh, of components of axis C of axis uh, C I. Okay. All right. Now uh, we can combine the product of uh, phi i and k k i in the following way. Now notice that if if suppose we want to construct phi i chi i. Now we go to this. Notice that phi i phi i times uh, d l. We assume that these uh, um, tubes have a small cross-section, small cross-section. So we can uh, approximate this quantity with uh, field B. Phi is the field through the cross-section. Phi is the product of the field through the cross-section. Uh, and then we have B times the cross-section to have phi, and the cross-section the cross-section SI has to be multiplied by DLI. So we get to D3 is a volume, okay? DV is a B, D, 3, X. For each I, we have an I here, we have an I there, etc. DLI, etc. Okay, so we are now ready to compute this quantity. So phi I, K, I is just the integral on each ci of a phi i a dl and this is the integral on each volume of a dot b d3 x on this volume and uh, this is helicity okay so we got to the helicity we got to the helicity for localized fields. So for localized fields, this is uh, precise. Now we want to find out something about this, uh, this number that appeared over there. Now, in order to understand that, uh, well, first of all, let me let me sum over all the tubes. So I should have said here is I. It's a single contribution. I sum up on all the tubes and I have uh, uh, summation over I of uh, the integral the I A dot B uh, D 3 X and this is uh, just a summation over the phi i k i and this is just uh, summation because we have an l k there l k i j i different from j of over the whole stuff phi i phi j okay so i said that we have this number we don't know what number it is and uh, we want to find it out. And in order to find it out, we have to um, express, we have to use uh, the relationship between A and B. Now, A and B is like U and omega. Uh, one is induced by the other. Uh, which one uh, is inducing is B. And what is inducing is inducing a potential. Right? So we have uh, to find out uh, this uh, induction. And this induction law, we saw it already, is B of R. Is B of R. So we have, uh, uh, we have uh, in general A, oops, due to B of R, and this A is uh, 1 over 4 pi um, integral of uh, B x star uh, I have to say that I suspect while I'm writing this, I know that this is correct. But I, I have a sense, it's probably, I don't have it with me now. 
But in the notes, if you go to the Biosavar Law, uh, uh, actually, I do have uh, the note, all the notes with me. Uh, the number, probably the number are, but probably the Biosavar Law for vorticity is a minus somewhere that doesn't click with what I'm writing. Um, I don't know if you go to chapter uh, chapter one uh, one point seventy eight. There is a minus to correct there, I think, because we have to start with the with the field, or at least this is the way I remember it. Uh, X minus X star, or let's say um, okay. Ah, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I was just uh, paused by by. I was just uh, thinking, what is this x star? The x star is the position vector. Oops, is the position vector on the on the on the on the on the, on the inducing? You know, b depends on x star because x star is the is the point uh, uh, is the source point. Okay, so this is the source point. So is a d three x star. So this is Biosavar. Hmm? Biosavar. Induction law. And when I wrote uh, uh, the induction law for vorticity, I'm pretty sure that I made a mistake. There is a, there is, on the notes, uh, it shouldn't be the minus that you have. It, because you, that's the way I remember it. Anyway, you can check. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the induction from B. And we have to take this and to put it in there, here. That's it. So we have to put it there. So you see, if we have fields that are localized, we can always uh, uh, take uh, these uh, phi dl as... Uh, as um, as the field times the volume. So if we do that, um, we get the following. Now, I, I forgot to say that uh, in general, uh, since uh, B is defined in terms of the vector potential A, we may think of a A in general given by A of uh, Biosavar plus uh, some uh, contribution of a gauge, so grad uh, let, let, let me call it like this, little phi. And uh, we can see that if we substitute this, if we substitute in, the, in this expression, in this one, the integral over V of grad phi, of grad little phi B D3x, uh, this is uh, integral on V of... Uh, the divergence of uh, little phi b uh, d3x. This is because, remember, b is divergence less. Hmm? Is, is, uh, we use the condition d if b equals 0. And, uh, and this is uh, integral on, uh, we use uh, uh, divergence theorem again, and this is the flux phi b through the surface, nu on uh, d2 on on uh, on d2x but uh, we assume that uh, there is no flux uh, b nu is no flux through the surface because the bounding surface is a magnetic surface so whatever is the gauge here that we are not happy with or happy with uh, it doesn't affect uh, the final result and the final result is that hm is uh, 1 over 4 pi Integral of uh, V uh, I, integral on V J of uh, X I minus X J. I'm just uh, using, I'm going back to indices. X1 uh, and X2 denoting C1 and C2. And if I'm generalizing this to a number of these uh, flux tubes linked to uh, one another, then I have uh, B I, uh, B X I. Uh, wedge B X J divided by X I minus 
xj mod 3 d 3 xi d 3 xj and uh, okay so this is indeed uh, uh, the sum of i different from j of l k i j phi i phi j in another sense in the sense that uh, where l k i j is indeed is indeed the gauss linking number So we established the connection between uh, um, helicity of uh, two, for the moment, let's say, planar rings uh, that are linked together. And then uh, many more, n planar rings uh, all together, or n combination of uh, uh, planar rings. Now, of course, we are not happy because we want to say something uh, even more general. What about uh, if, uh, because... The relationship is with linking number. We can now relax the fact that there are planar rings. We can deform them. There is no information about geometry here, so they can be not rigid planar ring, but uh, deformable. But still not happy because uh, we may have knots. What about knots and the very complicated uh, links? Okay, so this is uh, more or less uh, time to stop. Yes? Yeah. It's not the should be, uh, <coughs> oh, a three here. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's a three, of course. It's a three because uh, it's Bios of R. Hmm? Sorry. Okay, so uh, we come to a close of this course, and uh, uh, I cannot uh, stop without uh, going to knots and links. So I have to consider those, but uh, to give you a proof of what I'm stating is uh, impossible. Not even in, uh, in uh, you know, if I want to say something else, then I better use my time for something else than to give you the proof of this. But this is a piece of work I did with Keith um, some time ago now. <laughs> it's a joke long time ago. So uh, we have a result, uh, the following. Um, let me introduce first. First, I need, uh, I, need, uh, I need to go back, before talking about that, I need to go back uh, to the idea of a flux tube with a twist, because this is central in what I'm going to say. So uh, I'll uh, first duel on uh, another quantity that is topologically invariant, and is the following. So Tate, Tate, <laughs> Tate noticed that in his first publication, in his first paper, he noticed that uh, this linking number is great. But, but what about if I consider one knot, one knot? So, trifle knot. Trifle knot, I'm now trying my best again. Sometimes I'm lucky and sometimes I'm not lucky. Sometimes I get the trifle knot instantly. Sometimes I, I look it and then I look it. So this is a trifle knot. And he says, uh, yes, that's wonderful. It's a linking number. It, uh, it measures linkage. But what about knots? Do we have a way to measure linkage of knots? And he was very close to what to find what I going to tell you, because is written there, uh, at a certain point he says, well, I can think of a physical knot, and the physical knot, uh, you know, when we draw physical knots, we put tubes, and if we put tube, we put a second, a second curve, and just to denote the fact that this is, a, is a, some thickness there. And then he says, uh, well, I can consider, I don't know about the linking of a knot, it doesn't make sense, you know, terminologically, semantically. They're linking with what? It's one structure only. But 
If I think of some thickness, and this thickness being represented by these two uh, curves, uh, then I can think of the linking between one and the other. So I can do this in a, say, mathematical way, maybe, in thinking that uh, these two curves are collapsing on one curve. So, uh, okay, so I make uh, the, the, tu the tube thin and thin and thin until I get almost a line. It's not a line. It's never a line. I need two curves. But it's almost like a space curve. Okay. So what uh, can be done is the following. So we can construct, construct uh, a ribbon. Ribbon. And the ribbon is uh, uh, what I already drew. Uh, a center line. Oh, let me let me draw. Let me draw the center line in red. Is probably better. So we have a center line here, one curve. This is C1. C1. And then uh, I have a second curve, this one, that goes like this. And I construct uh, this as a ribbon. And the idea is. Uh, that maybe by using this uh, ribbon model, I can come up with some information on topology. The topology of this ribbon. And we already said that this uh, unit uh, quantity is n. We already said that this is C1, this is C2. We already said something. For example, that there is a twist that we can introduce, etc., etc., etc. He didn't go farther. He didn't go farther. He didn't go farther. So he stopped there and uh, he, he started to do measurements. Very interesting. Measurements. He constructed, uh, he produced uh, knots with a piece of uh, um, copper and he made the current flying, uh, flowing and he measured the, uh, at the time was called the power, hmm? uh, the electric power uh, or the some work that was done by the current. And then he reported uh, at the Royal Society uh, his uh, failure to measure knottedness by electromagnetic means, <laughs> which is amazing statement. 1880, um, 1870. Amazing. Um, Let's see how to get something out of linking number. So years passed and arrived a mathematician, a geometer from Romania, who did this work. I cannot produce the work here because it's 40 pages of mathematics. But the idea can be, can be, can be discussed quickly. We have one curve and the second curve. Linking with the first. So this is uh, C1, and this is, okay, whatever you like. You like it C2, maybe, C2 and C1. I should have, uh, okay, it doesn't matter. I wanted to reverse the colors, but too late now. And uh, you keep fixed, you keep fixed C2. It's not the way it's done the work, but uh, follow the concept. And now you modify... This second curve, I'm sorry I'm mixing up the symbols, but you understand what I want to say. So to be very close to C1. Hmm? So we didn't modify topology. Geometry changes, but topology is the same. And now we construct. We, we stop there and we think of the second curve, or the other way around, constructed from the first. So we put together a ribbon, and we do this. And this is exactly what Calugarianu, Calugarianu did. So we have a theorem here. So the ribbon, I repeat very, very quickly, a ribbon between uh, two curves, uh, C1 and C2, is uh, just defined as uh, uh, the sum of, uh, let's say, given uh, one curve, x1, uh, for C1, uh, in terms of X1, S, uh, we can construct a second curve, X2, as X1, function of S, 
uh, plus a measure, epsilon, finite, along n, n being the normal, unit normal. And then uh, we do something else. Now we start thinking that this uh, ribbon is uh, the same object, so the second curve, C2, is actually the first, plus something, plus some twisted. So we start thinking to drop this and to call the second curve C star, right, C star, and so it's only one thing, and then we have an X, an X, and the same here is an X and an X star. I use X and X star in, in Biosavar, huh? in, in the previous expression. We start thinking that these two curves are belonging, or one in the middle here, and another in the middle here, etc., to the same structure. But they are still separated by a finite epsilon. And now we can compute the, the linking number, LK, between what? Between one curve and the other, between C and C star. Okay? C and C star mathematically are separated, and this is well defined. And then what we do, we do what uh, you learn to do so many times uh, in school, limit for epsilon going to zero of this quantity. And you call this quantity self-linking, and the theorem, theorem goes like this, famous important theorem by Kaluga Reanu, uh, 19... 61 is the following. Uh, first of all, SL, self-linking number, is a topological invariant of the ribbon. And moreover, it admits the following decomposition, which is one of the rarest uh, things in the whole mathematics. A topological quantity that connects Global geometric quantities, writhe and uh, twist. Where? WR, I should stress, because it's important to stress it uh, when you introduce concepts, writhe depends on C only, and twist depends on C and C star through the ribbon concept, where writhe uh, is uh, writhe and twist. Oh, sorry, I didn't write it. Better to write it. Is uh, the writhe, writhing uh, of C and uh, uh, twist C, C star is uh, the total twist number of the ribbon R, C, C star. Now, there is a mathematical expression for the rise and for the twist. For the twist, for the twist, uh, you saw it already. For the rise, I write it immediately. And uh, what this uh, theorem says, says uh, that uh, it's like, uh, you know, for water, when you do, uh, you have uh, the total amount of water that can exchange between two uh, containers and they are connected, and it's the same thing. The total amount of information, you call it SL, but this SL, this self-linkage, 
can be either a lot of rise, a very low twist, or a lot of twist and very low rise. I come to explain that in a minute. I just like to give you the expression for the rise of C. So the rise is a geometric quantity. Where is the rising number of C and twist is uh, the twist number of C. Rise uh, is global. Geometric quantity of C given by uh, 1 over 4 pi, believe it or not, double integral is exactly the linking number with one exception that this is on C only. It depends only on one curve. That's why it's a geometric property of the given curve of C. And you have uh, what? You have x1 minus x2. Uh, okay, no, sorry. I used x and x star. x minus x star dx uh, wedge dx star uh, x minus x star to the cube. is exactly, now I can say it, is exactly B O of R. It's B O of R that play the role in helicity, in finding helicity in terms of linking number, with one exception, that in that case, it was a linking number, was really B of of R, because these were two distinct uh, uh, curves. But here is the same curve, same curve. And uh, twist of uh, C, C star is uh, a global geometric uh, quantity of the ribbon and uh, is uh, given by uh, it can be further decomposed we saw it as 1 over 2 pi integral of total torsion ds of C, so this quantity T, total torsion T, depends only on one curve, say the center of the tube axis, the tube axis, and uh, there is another one here that depends really on, uh, on uh, this is intrinsic twist, intrinsic twist, and this depends on uh, the uh, winding of the second curve, C star, with respect to the first. Okay? Remember the case of a straight, of the straight ribbon. If it is a straight ribbon, there is no total, to there is no torsion of the axis C, but you still have a rotation of this quantity N around it, and so you contribute with this term here. So this is called the uh, uh, curly N, and so we have T of uh, C plus uh, curly N of uh, C, C star. Now we, we can uh, finally express the result of helicity for knotted uh, tubes. And uh, linked tubes. We can generalize the result of Keith in 69. Okay. As I said, the derivation is a bit long and a bit convoluted. Uh, so this is the work we did together. And uh, is the following in uh, ideal condition the helicity HM of a magnetic of a magnetic knot B K um, centered. Okay, I dropped this centered on the knot. 
um, with tubular boundary um, a magnetic surface Uh, surface and flux phi is given by HM equal self linking number times the flux uh, phi square. Uh, sorry. So, in general, we can put these results together as a corollary of uh, of everything. What about a system of knots and links together of any shape? Then we can put uh, the uh, the helicity of each single contribution with the helicity of the mutual. So as a corollary, we have uh, the following uh, H for a system of uh, um, essential topology. We have Uh, H integral A dot B dV is equal to sum over I of uh, phi I S L plus sum I different from J, otherwise there is a two there, phi I phi J uh, L K I J. That's it. Now, the benefit of this formula and the benefit of uh, topological interpretation of this formula is uh, uh, great because we can, uh, instead of measuring A and B in a system, which is a lot of information, remember one of them is uh, Biot-Savart, and then we have to integrate over the domain of B. Imagine a system that is fluid and is moving, etc. I think it's much better, first of all, to evaluate the flux tube if the field is localized. And I will show you uh, at least one picture of plasma loops. And if we have time, and if you like to spend a little bit more time, I have a couple of movies. One I download, uh, available, okay, our public publicly available. There are beautiful movies from NASA and from other uh, missions, Inode, the Japanese mission and other missions, Trace, European missions, etc. So the, the, these localized fields are very localized. And so the flux can be measured rather easily, estimated rather easily. Now what about this measure, linking and uh, self-linking? Well, linking number is definitely not so difficult because uh, you take projection of an event, any projection, a picture. You take a picture of an event, and then by image analysis, you count, you, uh, you, uh, you, you, um, uh, you count the crossing, over crossing, under crossing. That is done in astrophysics, not so much, not so much. I talked about this uh, maybe 15 years ago in Boulder, telling them, uh, you know, they have data every single second of the sun, they should compute these things. It's easy to compute them, but everyone is busy, so at the moment, uh, I don't know. They are doing this, uh, some groups. But in biology, they were very quick to pick it up. And so now it's a standard technique. They take one picture of a biological, of DNA sedimenting, whatever it is, uh, in the shape, and they do data analysis on that, and they classify not knots and links. And they estimate this linking number through that. And self-linking, same thing. Self-linking is a geometric measure. Now, I have no time to, to show you this, but 
you know, the same analysis as I did, uh, or as I mentioned it for the Gauss linking number, can be done on the rise. We can interpret the crossings on the rise. Remember, this is dependent on the projection, is not a topological quantity, but similarly, we can come up with the same type of formula. Epsilon r being the, um, the, uh, the signs of the crossings, and we can estimate this, and we, if we take an average uh, estimate of that, uh, then we come up with the analytical rise. So you do several pictures, three, four satellites of the same event are sufficient to give you an approximate estimate of the exact rising number. As you increase the number of pictures of the same event, uh, this estimate uh, is getting better and better, gets better and better. You can control the, the error. Now what you have here from pictures well, uh, total torsion. Total torsion is not so difficult to compute. is co is numerically difficult to compute, but is not so uh, so difficult given uh, a picture, two or three pictures of the same event in space. But total torsion is always pretty low, and uh, this is the difficult one: twist. But for magnetic, uh, for solar loops, twist can be estimated by um, observation on uh, measurements of photospheric motion and they transfer twist in the loops. And of course, this is a critical quantity for energy uh, considerations. And uh, for other aspects, it's also the critical quantity for a number of us uh, to pay attention on. So twist, let's say that for physical application, twist is uh, important, more than maybe all the rest. Uh, but it's because we did all this progress that we can say this. Now we focus on internal structures and we go finer and finer in the analysis. Uh, as uh, when Keith came out with this result, uh, was considered uh, of no importance maybe, uh, many years passed and gradually uh, got importance, uh, especially through measurements relatively to energy of the phenomena. And then now we are going to look inside the structures and have more information. Anyway, I'll stop here. I think we end with a, a kind of seminar. Don't worry, it's pretty light. Uh, not much mathematics in there, beautiful pictures. And uh, we keep it light. Although uh, it's on something else. So I, I just encourage you to be here because I want to cover other aspects. And so through this, we'll do that. Okay, thank you for your attention. We resume in what, 15 minutes. Uh,